Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Thrive Co-Living Communities YouTube podcast. I'm Mark Stein, Thrive founder and your podcast host. We're creating sustainable, inclusive, and multi-generational residential communities. Our mission is to combat the epidemic of isolation, revitalize communities, and help others discover the many benefits of engaged community living by offering unique and ecologically sustainable co-living options. In this podcast series, join us as we discuss co-living, in addition to bringing you interesting people from around the world who are doing cool things to expand your knowledge and satisfy your curiosity. Through this podcast, learn more about our concept and see how Thrive Co-Living Communities will bring together people from all walks of life who want to enjoy the best of independent and group living. To find out more about us, please visit our website at thrivecolivingcommunities.org. Thanks for watching and enjoy the podcast. So hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Thrive Co-Living Communities YouTube podcast. I have as my guest, Jonathan Dean today, he's with a, an organization called Cabin, and he's a, an extreme enthusiast about co-living so i'm looking forward to finding out what he's up to what he's passionate about related to co-living and uh let us mix it up just a little bit so welcome jonathan thanks mark excited to be here and i uh, appreciate you having me on the podcast today great glad to have you so um give us in 30 minutes or less what your passion is related to co-living just For kick sure. us off a little bit tell us how you got into it sort of what your involvement is just yes tell us totally. so i'm interested in changing the way people live um my undergraduate degrees in economics and environmental studies and originally got very interested in economic development which eventually led me to take an urban anthropology class and soon learned you know how the world's population was rapidly growing and urbanizing and really it came down to how is our global civilization going to urbanize and how are we going to do that sustainably and naturally that led me into a deep passion which i still have today in urban planning um i kind of took a meandering route where i spent some time taking some graduate level coursework and my master's in urban planning but I actually stopped doing that and got more interested in real estate and taking some of my interests and passions in urban planning and sort of exploring those through a real estate lens. And that eventually led me to the organization that I contribute to full time now, which is Cabin. And Cabin is kind of a combination of a lot of my interests. And I'm just so thrilled to be working with the organization. Uh, we're about 18 months old. Uh, so still fairly new and, and things are, are moving pretty quickly, but I think we feel pretty grounded in our mission right now. And, and that mission here at Cabin is to build a network city. And by network city, what I mean is a network of real estate properties around the world that share culture, values, governance, and economy. And that's what we're building today. Uh, we have a very thriving online community. And one of our big focuses is kind of bridging the gap between online communities and in real life experiences. And we believe one of the most powerful vehicles to do that with is through co-living and actually having groups of people live together. Um, looking back at how America America has planned its its cities and its built environment, we spread out, we separated all of our uses. And uh, well, maybe for some folks, it's nice to have that two car garage and, and white picket fence and the little front yard and backyard. Um, I personally know that that's not going to give me fulfillment in life. And, you know, I think through the last couple of years, uh, through the COVID pandemic, we've realized the power of gathering online but we've also realized how important it is to gather in real life and cabin's mission is to bridge that gap between our online community and our in real life gatherings and co-living is an exciting vehicle for that because you know i don't think we're just fighting the COVID pandemic here 
I think we're also fighting the loneliness pandemic. And I think co-living is a really exciting vehicle to help people feel comfortable in who they are, be the best versions of themselves, reach their potential, all in a collaborative, uh, loving environment. Nice. And uh, obviously that dovetails a lot <clears throat> with what we're about in Thrive. You know, immediately what popped into my mind is VR. Um, there's going to be part of our online lives, um, and it's 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 been slow to come about, but part of our online lives are going to move into VR. Meta is trying to make this happen. Um, and I, I know this is just one half of what, and maybe not even a half of what you're thinking about with Cabin, but what do you, let's, let's talk about that part of our online lives since online is a, is a focus of, of yours. What do you think that's going to do? Um, do you think we're going to be, you know, some argue, and I, I've had some background in VR. I, I actually created the first virtual 3D shopping mall. And I got it to the point of being compatible with the Oculus headset. And so you can move around in this mall shopping like environment and <clears throat> and move around just by looking. So um, I suspect and it's it, again, it's moving slower than we think. But I think that that the virtual world is going to be part of our online world. What do you think that's going to do to feelings of alienation and loneliness? Do you think it's going to help solve it? Do you think it's going to make it worse? Talk a little bit about, <clears throat> about virtual worlds. Yeah, I mean, I think it all comes down to connecting with people. And if folks find that using tools like VR can help them connect, I'm all for it. Um, I think, you know, it is challenging to engage with an online community and really facilitate amazing connections and spaces like we might find at, you know, a dynamic dinner party with people from all over the world and, and different backgrounds. I think uh, at Cabin, you know, we're certainly open to using the tools of today to engage with our online community. But I think we we probably see the online community as a way to lead people to these powerful in real life experiences. Um, you know, a big focus here at Cabin and our co-living properties is that we want them to be immersed in nature. And a phrase that we use is, is nature out the door. Um, of course, you may have some regional hiking and, you know, natural spots within, you know, 30 minute drive, but we also want to be, you know, in, in a place where you can walk out your door and feel like, ah, I, I see trees, I see nature. I am in this habitat along with the other kind of living beings in this world. Um, so I think we're probably more focused on getting people back to reconnecting with nature. And of course, you know, understanding the, the tools of today to engage with folks, but really um, helping bridge that gap and, and making sure it's not all online. Um, and how do we get people to, to fill that seat at the dinner table? So, <clears throat> so virtual and online tools as a way to facilitate physical community? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's not to say that, you know, there are people that will maybe only ever engage with us online. Um, but I think as we've continued to build out this network, we're really focused on being an organization that's kind of finding the balance between technology and nature and sort of finding that harmony between the two. Um, but I think what we've seen through all the retreats and residency programs, and as we continue to do more co-living experiences and more like permanent and semi-permanent co-living is that the magic really happens um, when you're in person, you know, sharing these experiences together. Mm -hmm. um, talk about some of the activities that you've done. I think you've had some pop-up communities or just fill me in. Yeah, yeah. So over the first 18 months of Cabin's history, we've done a wide range of programs. We've done things as short as, you know, a week long um, build week where our community comes together to actually build things in real life. We built a pergola, we've built a sauna, um, we built a fire pit. Um, right now we're building shed rooms, which are converting a backyard shed into a housing unit at one of our properties um, in the Texas Hill Country, which we call Neighborhood Zero. 
Um, so we've done a, a lot of these build weeks. We just finished uh, two weeks of, of build weeks out and uh, in Puerto Rico, which was awesome. Um, but we've also done, you know, month long programs uh, like retreats and residencies. Um, actually, Cabin all started through these creator residency programs. A group of friends and colleagues got together and were like, hey, let's bring people from the Internet together in real life for a month just to work on creative projects and collaborate while also having some time in nature for some deep work. So they raised some money um, and then everyone that contributed to this crowdfund actually got to vote on which creators from the internet would come out to do this month long creator residency. So people applied on Twitter through uh, Twitter threads and then the community voted. And we did this you know, first cohort creator residency for a month and it was so great that we were like, all right, we need to do another one of these. So we did a second one. It was also so amazing. So we were like, let's do another one. So we did a third one. And after that third month long cohort, I think it was very clear to us that there was something more here than just, hey, let's bring people in from the internet to gather in real life. And that's really where the organization started ramping up its operations, bringing on some more contributors, um, and also bringing in some strategic partners to help capitalize the, the organization as well. And since then, we've done a whole slew of programs ranging from that week long to two weeks to a month. And starting a couple months ago, I think we got to this point where we realized, okay, these week long or month long experiences are super transformative. But after that week or month, people go back to their everyday lives and kind of get back into those old rhythms, which is fine. Maybe some people are just looking for that getaway and kind of a reset. But we started thinking, how can we build more consistent community where it's not just come for a week and then leave? And that's really where the co-living pass was born out of. And the co-living pass is this pass that our members can purchase that allows them to move between the properties in this network and co-live at our different locations. And you know what we're exploring right now is, is what is the balance of kind of longer term, more permanent residents with more of this revolving door where folks are coming for a month or a few months to, to live at these different properties. And I think that's something that will continue to evolve as we go you know, deeper into the co-living space. But we're super excited about you know, really leaning more into co-living as the vehicle for powerful connection. What do you see as the residential component uh, and I know it could vary between communities. And that that's what I'm really grappling with right now is looking for that affordable, because uh, I think affordability needs to be part, part of this, um, mm -hmm. especially for younger people just getting started. Affordable, maybe portable. Um, I'm seeing, looking into the accessory dwelling unit market, uh, boxable, Zenny homes. Uh, there's a lot going on in that space, but it's it's not happening very fast. Yeah. Um, and I also looked into shed to cabin, shed to home. Um, I'm I'm in Florida and want to have my first one, uh, first Thrive community in Florida, and they are just not going to be acceptable for uh, it as far as being accepted by code in counties yeah. that are not very remote. Um, so wh what are you what are you guys looking at as the ideal residential component? Um, or are you looking at house small houses uh, like a lot of co-living communities do? What, do? what do you see as the answer? Yeah, I think it's a great question and certainly a challenging one. I think what's what's cool about the cabin network that we're building is that each property, we call them neighborhoods. So each neighborhood is actually individually owned and operated. So a lot of people ask, hey, is, does cabin own property? Cabin actually doesn't own property. We are the network that ties these properties together and the community that serves as this kind of cultural backbone. Now, because each property is individually owned and operated, it might have its own engagement with cabin and it might also have its own little flair to the property. So, you know, one property might be more of a co-living hub that sleeps 15 people and more of a dense, you know, single family home setup that's kind of been retrofitted for some shared bedrooms or carving out more bedrooms, you know, within the existing house. Um, 
some properties like the neighborhood zero one, which is about 45 minutes outside of Austin in the Texas Hill Country, that property has two main structures. One is a three bedroom house and another one is a four bedroom, four bathroom shipping container home that the owner, or we call them caretakers, that the caretaker just built. So that's kind of co-living across two houses. But what's nice about the Texas Hill Country, unlike some other places, and it seems like you're encountering some of these challenges in Florida, is that it's pretty lax on what you can do out there. So we're able to take a, you know, a prefab shed and actually convert it into a housing unit. And I think affordability is something that's, you know, top of mind for us here, just because you see some other co-living operators that are providing um, units of housing that are catered more towards like super high income, maybe tech employees, where it's, um, hey, instead of paying 3000 a month, for the one bedroom in you know Silicon Valley, um, come pay twenty two hundred and live in this co living you know and great you know I'm excited that organizations are thinking differently about how we can house folks but and also it might be that you know some of these more luxury providers are the ones that are pushing it forward to start. Um, and then we see more of the, you know, general population come into, you know, ex accessibility of these places. But one thing I'm really interested in is, is sort of, okay, we know that by having more density in a place and more bedrooms and bed spots that we can probably deliver a product for more affordably. Let's actually do that for people that are more, you know, in the middle class. Um, so I think that's also something we'll see as each of our different neighborhoods will kind of cater to different audiences. One might be a more luxurious experience. And while one might be, hey, live in this shed room, you know, in the Texas Hill Country for 700 bucks a month or whatever it might be. Um, so I think we're, we really want to rethink how we set up spaces and how we have different options for people at different budgets uh, along the way. And I think <clears throat> the more I think about in terms of sustainability, the closer it takes me to the land. So, you know, it takes, it takes me further from luxury and, um, and high prices. So, yeah, it is interesting with, um, you know, experimenting with smaller spaces, but leaning into the idea that more of your life is spent outside. Uh, we spend so much time indoors and I don't think, you know, if we look back biologically that humans are used to that. Um, so by bringing more of these small spaces into the cabin network while being immersed in nature, we can kind of get the best of both worlds while delivering a more, you know, accessible product for folks. Mm -hmm. um, how do, how do permaculture principles factor in you're talking a lot about the outdoors and then being involved um talk about uh how permaculture is permeating your philosophy and cabin's philosophy yeah definitely so i think you know it comes down to our three guiding principles right now for cabin which are conserve create and co-live and i think the permaculture you know meshes well with that first one which is conserve um, actually, before we were kind of creator cabins, we were conservation cabins and, um, you know, a deep care for the natural world and ecological restoration is very core to who we are. I think we're, we're still exploring what that looks like on the ground for each of these neighborhoods in this network, but super excited about an opportunity right now where we have our first ever kind of permaculturist in residence that is coming out to live um, at Neighborhood Zero for the next three months um, to actually start working on, you know, how do we uh, revitalize the land? Um, we did uh, recently uh, add two longhorns to the Neighborhood Zero property. Um, so we're working on uh, kind of having them graze and and, you know, fertilize the soil through, you know, their their species. Um, so I think we have a lot more work to do on that front, but I think something that really weaves together our, our community and our caretakers is a deep care for the natural world and, and how do we live in harmony with it? 
And um, we're, we're excited to continue to explore things like conservation easements where we can set aside pieces of land that will never be developed on while then focusing on a smaller piece, you know, within that larger parcel to then develop more, you know, dense co-living you know, arrangements on that. Um, but definitely excited to, to continue that. And I think it also comes down to the caretakers, you know, the property owners themselves and their relationship to the land. I think what we've realized is we're looking for folks that have a deep sense of place and a, a deep connection with that land. So they really want to steward the land, care for the structures on it, and facilitate the connections that take place on it. And I think that's one thing that separates cabin, you know, from other kind of marketplaces that connect people in space is that this isn't a transactional, you know, relationship where you show up at a property, hopefully you can figure out the lockbox or the keypad entry and it's midnight and you get in there and you never interact with the host and you maybe don't even interact with the local community there. That's not what we're about here. We want to create deep, meaningful connection between the people on the, the property and the land on the property. And I think that's why having a superb caretaker is really important to the cabin mission um, as we continue to grow this network of properties. Talk a little bit about your thoughts on your structure where you're, you've got a property owner, caretaker, and then you'll have people, I assume, who will be renters. Um, that's something that I grapple with a lot because I think ideally um, we want people to feel ownership uh, in the community. We want them, we want the activities to come from the ground up. Yeah, and not coming from a director, a social director, or or a community director. Um, but when you, I see some possible friction there of those two goals. If you if you don't have the community own the property, <clears throat> then I wonder how much ownership there will be, and uh, if that wouldn't foster. And I hear this a lot in. Uh, typical co-living communities where there's a lot of pressure coming from below, serve me, serve me, you know, do, do this, do that, uh, rather than ownership coming from the, from the community members. Talk a little bit about that and how that structure might coexist with a ground swell of community support. Yeah, I think that's a tough one. And it's certainly a delicate balance. Um, I do think it comes back to the caretaker and the culture that they're setting at the property. I think it also comes down to that balance of, of longer term residents with more of the, you know, residents that are coming for just a few months. Um, something that I, I think we're seeing is that having maybe more longer term residents on the property establishes a more consistent culture. So then when new new folks come in, they kind of already see how things are are run. And also that existing culture is, is really not something that cabin is doing from this top-down approach. That's the community co-creating that together. Um, but I think there's a, a really interesting point you make of like, if folks don't have you know, actual ownership or equity in the property, how do we create environments where they still feel that sense of ownership? And, and that's something I think we'll, we'll always, you know, be navigating uh, in, in our journey here. But I think it comes down to the caretaker and the culture they set. And then, you know, they provide some structure, but still with enough flexibility where it does feel like this collaborative ground up uh, culture setting process. Yeah, maybe if they're a benign owner um, and feel pretty secure, then I think some of it is, uh, probably a lot of it is in the decision-making process that is instituted. So, for example, um, we're, we're committed to having a consensus uh, decision-making process. And for those who are not familiar with it, everybody has to agree 100%. Or if somebody objects to a decision, they have to say, well, I'm not comfortable with it, but I'm not going to hold back the process because the consensus takes everybody agreeing. So 
uh, the more democratic the community is, the more input other people have, uh, or all the people have, uh, that can help build that. And then I think a lot of it is surrounding selection of people, of the people. And that's a sticky, sticky, slippery slope too. Can it be sticky and slippery slope? No, I don't think so. I think uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, if, and, and we've thought about this a lot, the, the, the personalities of the people coming together, you can get someone who really thinks a lot of their opinions and boy, if if the group isn't agreeing, they can make things really miserable. So I think selection is important too. And one thing related to that is if you if you can do the selection such that you find people that are truly committed to permaculture principles, taking care of the land, then I think you've got a better chance of having people more naturally participate and take care of the land, even though it's not theirs. For example, I it's almost impossible for me if I'm out for a walk, not to pick up a freaking piece of trash on the ground. So if you get people that are, that have that that feeling, then you've got people naturally picking up trash and not distributing it. So I don't know. What are yeah. your thoughts about all that? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I think one one thing that helps in the case of cabin is our online community. So when folks are showing up you know, to actually co-live together, they already have a sense of, you know, cabins values and culture. Uh, and maybe they already actually have met some of the other residents online. So it's not totally random and it's not totally unfamiliar. Um, and then also, you know, because each property is a little bit different, I think there's a self-selection process there where someone that maybe wants, you know, more of uh, yoga and wellness it's going to choose this property, but someone that really wants to be involved in permaculture and regenerative agriculture and whatnot uh, chooses this property. So you already have some of the, the like-minded people gathering, uh, which I think can be really helpful. But I think we're we're definitely you know encouraging our caretakers to think about things like authentic relating and nonviolent communication and and putting systems in place that allow the community members to work out disagreements uh, amongst themselves uh, in a way that that feels real and transparent. Yeah, we feel like mediation is an important component to have a process in place and people train to facilitate those meetings as mediators um, to resolve conflict because boy, there's there's no matter how harmonious, how homogeneous the group, uh, you're going to have conflict for sure. Totally. Yeah. I think it's never going to be perfect because humans aren't perfect. And when you're living with people, you really get a, a close, you know, intimate sense of, of who they are, what makes them tick. And, um, you know, it's going to bring out um, any sort of disagreements, uh, whether it's in the first week or the first year, um, things are probably going to come up. And, and that's also why we're thinking about you know, for neighborhood zero, we're going to have regular cleaning. Um, so we can kind of see where friction points might arise and try to, you know, squash them beforehand. So it's not like, oh, you're never cleaning up for yourself. Of course, people need to do their own dishes. You know, this isn't a, a five-star hotel. Um, but, you know, for things like common elements of, you know, who's, you know, cleaning the toilet, um, and maybe there's not a sense of clear ownership. Um, well, maybe it's the community's job to figure out who who owns that task um, or which squads of people own certain tasks while still giving you know room for people to engage on other parts of caring for the home. Um, but then with a little bit of cabin help, we can help you know uh, make sure those toilets are clean as well so everyone has a good experience. You know, Somebody asked me recently what I thought the biggest challenge will be in setting up a community. We're still in the conceptual stage of our community. And a term came to me 
it's actually been the title of a book that was written 20 years ago. I just wasn't aware of it. The term radical acceptance mm. uh, came to me. And I think that, I mean, it's such a challenge. Those of us who have partners and kids, it's such a challenge to be accepting of our partner, much less accepting of a larger group of community that's that's interacting with each other and i frankly i think that the reason that we're that we're so separate and we have separate dwellings and and we're we're not more in community in our neighborhoods is that we we're challenged with being able to be accepting and we're so quick to cop attitudes so i think it's going to be really challenging and and for your folks that are there for longer periods of time really challenging to be able to open up our uh, loosen up our um conclusions about people and our attitudes about people and really be able to to practice radical acceptance in order to live together as a community yeah totally i think a few things come to mind um you know the first is having that radical acceptance with yourself and being comfortable in who you are. Um, because I think humans are very quick to deflect or, or judge others, or maybe they're judging themselves first. So if we zoom out, how do we create an environment where people feel like they can be their authentic selves and um, care for themselves, just like they'd care for a best friend. Um, so that's, that's one piece. Um, the other thing, the other piece is like, you know, accepting that you know maybe i won't be best friends with everyone and that's okay there's no hard feelings you know you can't if you're living with 15 people you can't be best friends with everyone um but i think humans naturally especially in a world that's so fast moving and we're seeing so many people and cultures you know flash between our eyes we're very quick to judge because it helps make the world easier to understand and digest which in some cases it is helpful of like okay that person you know um may be making me feel unsafe it's good to categorize them in that situation if they're acting a little strange on the street but that being said you know we want to have situations where people acknowledge that they're maybe judging someone but can remove those biases and actually come in with empathy and listening um to better understand you know who that person is and understand that their background and their perspectives and their upbringing are probably completely different from yours and that's okay and they have their story and it's just as valid as my story and maybe we'll become friends maybe we'll become best friends uh or maybe we'll just you know keep it keep it informal and just be an acquaintance where hey when i see this person i don't always stop and do a long chat but i say hi and we exchange exchange pleasantries and we're both okay with that and that's all right Mm -hmm. Tara Brock is the uh, woman that wrote Radical Acceptance. Mm. Um, I think it was 20 years ago, if anybody wants to look it up. And she does say that the, that the key to this is being easy on yourself, compassionate mm. with yourself, because I think many of us who are reflective realize that we are toughest on other people around the topics that we are toughest on ourselves about yeah i think um i think it's always going to be a journey for for finding that balance and just being patient with yourself you know and and showing care um and, and taking time to slow down and not push feelings down um and that's what's cool about co-living because i feel like you have a built-in social kind of support network with you where um, in some ways, it's a bit of therapy. If you feel like you have people that you're living closely with that you can go and talk about these challenges. I was part of one uh, co-living experience and it was a month long experience and it's strong language, but the word that you know came to my mind was like that it was in a healing accelerator. People came in just out of a, a breakup or you know going through some personal challenges, and because they had this loving support system, they were actually able to you know heal and and reconcile uh, you know any trauma they were experiencing uh, because they were surrounded by great people. And I think 
that's really powerful and definitely something we're, we're looking to continue to uh, welcome into our spaces. What about diversity? Um, what, what kind of challenges do you think there are around bringing in diverse groups into co-living? Yeah, I think this is a industry-wide challenge and something that you know, we'll have to continue to be intentional about. There's a few factors that I think are are not working for us. So Cabin has a lot of folks that work in technology, and naturally that's a pretty white male dominated space. Then you layer on the real estate piece and real estate ownership piece, and we don't have to even say how unfairly through systemic racism and redlining that this has damaged generations and we're experiencing generational trauma and just an unfair situation where people of color have just had challenges owning property through the system that America has built. So there, those are just some kind of macro level challenges. And then, you know, something more specific to our residents is that a lot of our residents are remote workers. There is a, you know, a lot of service uh, employees and healthcare employees and um, people, a lot of people have to be grounded in where they live with where they work. So that's certainly something that's a challenge for us as well. And we're going to continue to, you know, welcome in folks from all walks of life. And, you know, when we start a new neighborhood, I think it's really important that we don't have it be a white male dominated space and that we set the culture from the beginning that we have people from all walks of life that are there sharing space together. So then when that next person comes in, they feel more comfortable to begin with. But it's certainly a challenge and certainly conversations around this are, are top of mind here at Cabin. You know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs talks about how, you know, if you're just worried about just putting food in your mouth, you're not going to have a lot of mental space or emotional space to be thinking about high-minded, highfalutin ideas. And I do feel like, uh, and, and maybe it's my lack of exposure to a broad range of people, but I, I think that people that are drawn to co-living have a certain luxury of space and mental and emotional space and those who who are at a lower socioeconomic level would be challenged to even be thinking and aspiring to these things you know so i i i think it's really difficult and there and i think a certain level of education comes along with uh in general um comes along with these ideals um, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think that's, it's really tough. And I think that's why, you know, we're interested in bringing things like shed rooms into the network and using the economics of co-living to actually provide more housing that is affordable for some folks where it's actually in their budget to begin with. And then they can maybe make the decision if this is the lifestyle they want to live. But if it's $2,200 to live in the, you know, high rise co-living building in San Francisco, you don't even have a shot. Um, but it, it's certainly a challenge. Why do you think there's so much interest in co-living? My sense of it was that there, there was a spark, a healthy spark right before COVID. Um, and then people, and co-living sort of adjusted during COVID, but it's, and it may just be because I just became interested around that time, um, but it seems like, and when I attend co-live events, and let's plug co-live uh, for a moment, co-live.org, I think there's a hyphen in there, co-live.org, uh, does programming, it's a not-for-profit membership organization, probably a little overlap with what you're doing, but um, they're mainly providing support to people that are interested in co-living. And there's 
there was a program in the Nordics and one in Africa. And it just seems like, and a lot going on in Asia and India, there seems like a lot of interest in co-living. Um, and prior to the pandemic, what, what do you, what do you agree that it's sort of uh, hit a bubble and why do you think all this, why do you think now? Yeah. I think I'm with you in that as I've gotten deeper into it, it's been getting more popular, but I think I'm also just in the circles that co-living, you know, operates in, but I think There's that a lot of passion around it. Yeah. I think that a lot of people are looking for alternatives. Um, I think we've seen that as our cities around the country have experienced a lot of revitalization and gentrification for good or bad, um, people are, are flooding into the cities, both millennials, you know, empty nesters looking for a little bit different of a lifestyle from this sprawled out suburban lifestyle that dominated you know the 20th century and certainly the the latter half of the 20th century and i think we've seen that it's not a great life um so there's this larger trend of people going back to the cities and looking for more human-centered experiences which i think have helped make our cities more livable especially in the last couple of years through the pandemic um, and with that we've seen a lot of uh, apartment buildings built and designed catering to people looking for this new lifestyle. You see a lot of these buildings have amenity amenities that buildings built in the 80s and 90s didn't have through the, you know, the rooftop pool and the luxurious gym and the podcasting room and the big extra living room. And that's, I think, is, is related to co-living, but actually in its own separate lane. But what those buildings are designed for is getting at something to the core that I think co-living is getting at as well is like, let's connect more and let's have shared spaces where maybe my apartment's a little bit smaller, but I have these shared spaces. But what I think a lot of those buildings got wrong is that they weren't designed to have these spontaneous interactions. So the roof deck with the pool is all the way at the top. You would never go there unless you were going for a swim or you had a couple of friends over and you were going up there. I saw this one building that actually put the laundry. This is in Australia. They put the laundry on the roof. Oh, well, now people actually have to go to the roof. They're having these bump ins with other people and then connecting from there. And I think a lot of these amenity rich, you know, multi hundred unit buildings are getting at the, the amenities, but they're not getting at the actual design. And I think co-living takes it one step farther of like, let's actually design our spaces to really be used for connecting centered around a shared kitchen, um, you know, maybe sharing bathrooms as well, maybe even sharing bedrooms as well. But having the design and the human flow integrated into the whole living experience. And I think that's what, you know, is super exciting about co-living. Um, but in terms of, you know, why now? I think people are just ready to think a little bit differently. And they see that, wow, I'm in this apartment building with hundreds of people, but I don't even know my next door neighbor, or I'm in this city with thousands of people live on my block, but I don't even know what's going on. I only talk to people because I just got that puppy. And now we run into each other, uh, which is great that that, you know, those pets make that loose social tie. But I think we're seeing now, okay, this movement back to the city has been great. And it's super dynamic and there's so many cultural amenities and food and restaurants and, you know, nightlife and whatnot, coffee shops and galleries. But let's take it one step farther. And I think co-living is is challenging that. And where Cabin kind of fits into this is we totally are, are with that. But we're like, what if we did that in nature and really bring people back to nature and reconnect with that part of the experience while still having the space designed for deep connection and social interaction as well mm -hmm. maybe that's the answer that you you stumbled on maybe everybody should have to have a dog everybody <laughs> because i and i do uh i'm in a condo complex and 
I, at least I talk to, and I may not know all their names, but I know the dogs. And I'm more likely to know the dog's name than the person's <laughs> name. Right. But maybe, maybe that's the answer. And then I think where they get it wrong in those apartment buildings with these beautiful amenities is that they don't focus on programming. They're not trying to bring people together and have it come from beneath. But it's, you know, it it's probably impossible to build it and then have people take on we're talking about the ownership again take on the ownership it's just too too much inertia that's that's needed well um as we come upon the up on the end of our time talk to me about some things that you that we haven't talked about that you're passionate about that you think is key to co-living um I don't know. I, I just I want to open it up to anything that you've been thinking. And uh, it's so interesting to to meet with people who are thinking about this. You know, I can tell that, you know, when you're out for a walk or exercising or whatever, or even in the shower, uh, we're we're processing these sorts of things. How do we make this work? Um, so what else are you thinking about that we haven't talked about? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all trying to solve this puzzle of uh, genuine human connection and and creating lives where we feel fulfilled. And I think, you know, I just feel so grateful to be working with Cabin because it's really a full circle moment here as my deep interest in urban planning and cities, you know, has blossomed over the last 10 years. And then on the side, my interest in regenerative agriculture has also blossomed. And now I see these two paths actually coming together. And how do we pull from both of these things and create these spaces? And I think that's what Cabin's you know, out to do. And we're super excited. Uh, right now we're, we're in a position where we're ready to actually grow and add new neighborhoods into this network of co-living properties. So I guess I'll make a small plug here that if you or anyone you know um, owns a property or is looking to co-buy a property with friends, we've been helping folks co-buy properties together. If you think that your property would be a good fit to add to this network, feel free to reach out. We could definitely have a conversation. Um, but if you're not a property owner or aspire to be one day and you just want to connect with the community, I would definitely recommend checking out the co-living pass uh, because as we continue to add more neighborhoods into our network city, it's going to become really special where you could go here for three months and escape the winter here for three months. And, oh, maybe, uh, you know, this one you found, huh, this is my home. And I want to, you know, establish some more roots here, you know, and I think we're, we're excited to be building with folks and growing our community and creating spaces where people can reconnect with nature, you know, work remotely, uh, surround themselves with like-minded individuals that also share different perspectives that make for a good conversation around uh, some good food in, in beautiful places. So, yeah, I just want to say thank you, Mark, for having me on today. Um, I really enjoyed our, our, conversation and uh, really like what you're up to and uh, excited to keep the conversation going. If you want to follow Cabin, uh, you can find us on Twitter at creatorcabins.com. Uh, you can also check out our website at cabin.city. Um, we'll be in a place near you someday soon. And if not, come build with us and we'll build the future together. Give your email address. Oh, yes. So you can find me at community at creatorcabins.com. Uh, you can also reach out to me on Twitter at JD Kalis. That's at J-D-K-E-I-L-E-S. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. It's uh, been an invigorating conversation. Uh, we're thinking about so many of the same things. And um, I think I think we're going to solve it. I and, think so. And those who are, who are like-minded, there are a lot of people that are interested in, in making this happen. So I think it will. Day by day, uh, together we build. Um, thanks again, Mark. Really appreciate the time. All right. Thank you. And um, everybody feel free to reach out uh, to Jonathan. And um, if you're interested in supporting our project, uh, there's a lot down in the uh, show notes. We'll have Jonathan's contact information in there as well. So we have these podcasts every week. So tune in, uh, subscribe on YouTube, subscribe on your 
favorite podcast channel for audio versions. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us for another great episode of the Thrive Co-Living Communities YouTube podcast. To learn more about our mission and how you can support our vision of creating co-living communities worldwide, please visit us at thrivecolivingcommunities.org. To receive advanced viewings of our podcast and other exclusive content, find us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Thrive Co-Living Communities. You can also learn more ways to support our mission in the show notes below. Amazon Smile, GoFundMe, Kroger, and our own Thrive Gear store, where you can buy t-shirts, hats, and many other items. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon.